Welcome to a teaching series entitled The Pastor's Call. An important aspect of the call, of course, is to recognize that the Lord is the one who calls us to ministry. The call to ministry is not a vocation, it's not a profession, although some may see it that way. The call to ministry is a divine invitation by our Father in Heaven to be part of the spiritual leadership of His church. God sees something in you that you may, be, you may not be able to discern in yourself. And I can assure you, it's not your outward appearance or your special talents or skills or abilities that He needs. All He needs is a willing heart, a heart that will do all that He asks you to do. Remember in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it is said of King David, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Many people memorize that scripture, but they forget that he's the one who will do all of my will. The father is also looking for someone who will shepherd his flock with love and care. The father's love is what sets Christianity apart from all of the world's religions. And finally, God is looking for a leader who will be sensitive to the promptings and the leadings of His Holy Spirit. God's not looking for someone to simply lead His church. God is looking for someone who will lead His church His way. Doing things God's way uh, means uh, there must be open communication between God and the leader. God's leader must be open to receive personal revelation from Him. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17, there is an account when Jesus is con confronts his disciples with a profound question. And he asked the question, who do people say that I am? They immediately responded uh, with what other people were saying. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus probes with a deeper question. Who do you say that I am? For over 2,000 years, every believer has had to deal with this question. Who is Jesus to me? Is he a religious figure, a prophet, a good teacher, or something else? After Jesus asked this vital question, Peter answered with the following. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, let me take a moment to explain the word Christ. The word Christ is not Jesus' last name. The word Christ is a title. And the Hebrew equivalent of Christ is Messiah. The English equivalent of both those words would be Savior. So what, what Peter was recognizing is that Jesus was the Savior. He was the Son of God. Now this, of course... The, uh, this is, of course, the answer Jesus was looking for. But what Jesus wanted all of them to see, then and now, was that it was not through logic or intellectual understanding that Peter came up with the answer. Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, that was Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, this is known as personal revelation or even divine personal revelation. It's when God, by His Spirit, makes known to your spirit something you could not possibly know or understand on your own. Now, we also have the Bible, and we receive personal revelation through the Bible as well. Now, we know that God is the author of the Bible, and God Himself gave personal revelation to the writers of the Bible uh, because it says in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration, personal in, uh, revelation, uh, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And even Paul said, but I make known to you, brethren, that, for, that the gospel for which uh, was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11 through 12. Now, when does personal revelation come? As a believer in Jesus Christ, 
you have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you have eyes, ears, and a mind to comprehend spiritual things. By faith, we believe that the Word is true, and therefore we believe and act upon the Word of God. Now, personal revelation can come at any time. It can come during prayer time. It can come during meditation time. It can come during a scripture reading, and, and even during the preaching and the teaching of the Word. God can give you revelation even in the circumstances that He puts you in. Because God is the God of circumstances, and He's able to direct circumstances to reveal Himself and His plan. Now, not every believer is called to the fivefold ministry described in Ephesians 4.11. But every believer functioning as an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher needs to make their calling sure. 2 Peter 1.10 one final and hopefully obvious point is that any personal revelation cannot contradict the Word of God. Throughout the ages, many believers have, have been led tragically, ast uh, tragically astray from the truth. Remember, the enemy of our soul, the devil, is an expert at deception. But God has given us His Word, He has given us the Scriptures, and He's given us His Spirit to keep us on the path of righteousness and truth. An important question is to understand to whom and to what God has called us. Now remember, faith moves God, confidence moves man. And I'd say that as a way of reminder, and being careful to make a distinction between faith and confidence. The main difference that we need to remember is that faith is spiritual, while confidence is natural or of the soul. As a spiritual leader, we must be men and women of faith because we know that it's impossible to please God without faith, Hebrews 11:6. And it's also true that faith begins when the will of God is known. Therefore, faith is impossible when the will of God is not known. All the more reason to make your calling sure. As a ministry leader, we're required to train, equip, and lead people that God puts into our trust. It is the outward appearance of your faith or your confidence which inspires trust in others to follow. Remember, you cannot be a leader if no one is following you. Having said that, we realize that all Christians, whether in the, in the fivefold ministry or not, are called to the Great Commission. And the Great Commission, in its simplest terms, is to know Christ and make Him known. And we see the Great Commission established in each of the four Gospels. But then we of the fivefold ministry, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers, are also called to be gifts to the church, the body of Christ, with the specific task of training up the saints, the believers, to do the work of the ministry. That's Ephesians 4.12. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will build my church. Many leaders will try to do something only Jesus can do, and that's build his church. If only Jesus is to build a church, then what are we to do? Well, we are called to build up his people. So many confuse building the church with building a reputation or being successful in the eyes of fellow leaders in ministries. But our task is to train up the men and women of God to do the work of the ministry. This means that our ministry is to train others to teach, to preach, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to evangelize. And we'll discuss this more fully in the next section, which is confidence in ministry. It is of the utmost importance to know that you are in fact called to the ministry. It's also very important to know to whom you were called and where you were called. We know from reading the scriptures that the Apostle Paul was called to the Gentiles. We see that in Acts 9.15. The Apostle Peter was called to the Jews. We see that in Galatians 2, 7 through 8. And of course, many of, disciples, many of the original disciples or apostles traveled to foreign lands. And to this day, Christianity has gone to the outermost places of the earth because they were called and they were, and they went. They were called, they were sent, and they went. 
The question every individual who's called by God must answer is to whom and where are you called? And the question can only be answered by personal revelation through the Bible, prayer, and time with Him. Don't trust in the wisdom of men. Seek Him and Him alone. Remember John 15, 16. You did not choose me, that's Jesus speaking, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give you. You can't afford to waver in faith in your calling to the ministry. I know that God has given us emotions, and they're necessary for the soul. But faith is not an emotion. Faith is a spiritual decision to believe God. If you rely on emotions, then one day you're going to feel called. And then on another day, you're not going to be so sure of your calling. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then in, in, in Philippians 3.14, Paul says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and Jesus Christ. We can't waver. Once we have set our eye on the path, we must pursue it regardless of what comes against us. Now let's take a moment to look at God's timing. God's call to ministry can come at any age, at any time, to any person. There are many who are called as children, as well as in old age. While one may know that they are called, it's important to wait until God arranges the circumstances to fulfill the call. We serve a God who's not constrained by time. Therefore, when He speaks, it always seems like, do it now. But we must be sure of the timing as well as the call. Now, an important question to answer is, can a man call a person to ministry? You must be sure that you are called by God and not by a man. Now, men or women are able to recognize the call in someone else, but I'll tell you, man, a person cannot impart the call to someone else. The call is from God. A call from God also means that He is able to supply you with anointing from the Holy Spirit to accomplish the call, and no person can do that. Make sure it is God who calls you. Only God, through His Holy Spirit, can reveal to you His plan and purpose for your life. The ministry, as I said before, is not a profession or a vocation where you get to choose your career track, but it's a calling of God to partner with Him. It's God's plan and God's way. Now, having said all of that, uh, I, I need to, to, to make you aware that there are many challenges to the call of God. And you'll face many of these challenges even while in the ministry. So that's why it's important to recognize early that the challenges that you face are going to be spiritual battles. Are you prepared? Are you equipped? Are you alert to the schemes of the devil? There will be many attempts to undermine your authority, to undermine your anointing, to undermine your testimony, to undermine your, your reputation as God's choice as a leader. Do you know the enemy and his strategies and his weapons? The Bible teaches that there are three powerful enemies, so to speak, and that each one of them seeks to undermine and destroy or neutralize the Christian leader. They are the devil, the flesh, and the world. These three areas are not separate and distinct. In fact, they are all blended together and work as one force trying to undermine and discredit the call of God on your life. What is important to understand about spiritual warfare is that it is real, it's ongoing, and it's destructive. The most tragic mistake we could be is to dismiss spiritual warfare as myth or non-existent. Because we cannot see the spiritual realm with our natural senses does not mean it's not real. The Bible affirms the reality of spiritual warfare, and it would be wise for us to agree with the Scriptures. 
Now, we'll be taking a look at spiritual warfare in the next section uh, having to do with confidence in the ministry. Now, here are some thoughts. Being called to the fivefold ministry is about one, what one does, not what your identity is. Your identity, or who you are, is simple. You are a child of God, and scriptures say that you are a son. The terms apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are not titles, but describe the work or the function of that person. There are those who have the title, but they're not performing the function of a fivefold minister. Just as there are men and women who function in the fivefold ministry, but don't have the titles. The most important thing to remember is that you are a son who serves in the ministry. Remember that God can't bless what he doesn't approve. Being called to the ministry has great responsibility to live rightly and be a genuine model of integrity and holiness to the people we represent. Being in the ministry is not about privilege and power, but being in the ministry is about service and humility. We must behave the same when we're in church, when we're at home, or in the marketplace. There is no place for hypocrisy for the ministry person. Personally, I've seen this many times. People living one way when they're in church and living a very different way when they're home. Let us never be found to abuse or take advantage of the people God has given us. Manipulation, control, using guilt and shame must never be a part of our ministry. And God has much to say about abusing his sheep in Jeremiah chapter 23. Let us never imitate others in ministry unless they imitate Jesus' character and his integrity. In every way, let us imitate Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 16, and then 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. You are God's personal choice to do what he's called you to do. Your king has called you to the ministry. Don't, uh, don't let others try to belittle you or ridicule you uh, in the belief that you are called by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Our call is to be ministers of the new covenant. And we have such trust through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves or think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And so there are two important points in the preceding scripture that we need to look closely at. Number one, we're called to be ministers of the new covenant. The new covenant, or the New Testament, is a better one and replaces the Old Covenant of the Law or the Old Testament. This means that it, it is not the letter of the law or legalism that gives life, but the Spirit which gives life, grace. The second point that is very clear is that the work of the Holy Spirit is essential in the message of the New Covenant. It is the Spirit or the Holy Spirit of God that gives life to the Scriptures and to the believers. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Word of God to us, causes the Word to come alive to us. It's the Holy Spirit that produces personal revelation. And it's the Holy Spirit that causes us to discern the truth. As ministers of the gospel, the good news, we must make sure that our message is a message of grace and mercy, and that it is not a message that has been compromised by the world or even our own opinions. Now, we know that the devil is the father of all lies and that there's no truth in him. That's John 8, 44. Deception is what he does best. Now, the tragedy of deception is that when a person is deceived, they will not know it. See, that's the nature of deception. We can see it at work in the Garden of Eden. When, and, and has God indeed said to you, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see, the devil, when stating that, created doubt by mixing a lie with the truth. What God actually said 
is that they could eat of any tree but one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Doubt led to deception, and deception led to sin. Now, a partial truth is still a lie. For example, a drop of poison in a glass of water poisons the entire glass of water. And what this means for us as ministers is that we cannot mix the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. Grace and law will not work. Even a little law will be poisonous. Mixing the philosophy of the world into the church can weaken or dilute the power of the church and the working of the Holy Spirit. If there were no difference between the world and the church, why would anyone be attracted to the message of the gospel?